Um, okay, welcome to um, the University of Law uh, Leeds campus. By way of introduction, my name's Matt Tomlinson, I'm the Dean of this campus, um, and I'm joined this evening by James Morton, who is an alumni of the um, university. Um, he attended um, Gibson and Weldon, which is a previous form of the university, formerly College of Law, um, and um, studied with us and then went on um, to enjoy what is the most fascinating um, career. Um, I've spent a little bit of time with James prior to the, um, this evening starting and just listening to his um, tales of his time in practice um, and then what took him into um, a career as an author um, and a very uh, interesting um, career as an author, um, having produced some very um, notorious uh, publications in true crime um, biographies. Um, so this evening is an opportunity, really, to celebrate one of our own who um, has gone on to, to this great career and also to learn um, about that time and, and his experiences. So very warm welcome, James. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do, really, is, is start by asking you um, what um, prompted you to um, go into a career in law? Basically because I couldn't do mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason. My, there were two reasons. That and my father, who was a spice merchant, his brother was an accountant, his other brother was a doctor. He, I think, felt let out or let down, and I was going to become what he called a solicitor. And... Uh, in those days, you didn't need um, mathematics at O level, as it was then, whatever it is now, to become, a, uh, to become articled. And so they went through the profession. I, they, they had a whole family gathering one afternoon, and they went through the professions. I couldn't be a doctor, obviously. I couldn't be um, an accountant. I couldn't be an architect. I couldn't be an army officer. There was no question of me being... On the, on the ground because I'd march they would, I wouldn't know how to march the men 12 miles per hour to get home by barracks I couldn't be a naval officer because I might bring the submarine up in Valparaiso instead of Valencia and that left the church and they reckoned I could count the Easter offering slowly and, <coughs> and there were quite big Easter offerings in those days and the law and they fortunately, or my old man wasn't sufficiently cynical to force me into the church. And so I became an article to a solicitor. In those days, he paid a premium for the privilege of this, which I got back after I passed the um, intermediate. They paid back weekly. Um, and uh, I, I joined a London firm. That didn't actually last desperately long, which because I had a, a, a something of an accident. What happened was in those days you had divorce cases uh, which were heard in court undefended divorce cases. The woman would go into the witness box or the man would go into the witness box and say I can't live with my husband, uh, he's committed adultery, uh, beaten me up etc etc. And this was um, a, a, a woman uh, this was the firm was really quite a smart firm he, uh, the principal used to wear a monocle and the article clerks were allowed to go and take divorce statements. So you went down to see somebody, and there was um, you had to make sure that they made a confession. I have met um, this boy of mine, and we've started to have sex together. And you had to look around and see that there was male and female clothing in the room. And, and this man sent me down, my principal, as it were, sent me down somewhere near Godalming, which is down in Surrey. I think I was 17 at the time, and I was got there desperately early because I didn't want to be late. And he said, to you, he got this monocle, he said, they're very, very in love, this pair, very in love. Make sure you get it right, Morton. So I got there, and this gorgeous girl who looked like, in my day, Martine Carroll, but now Julia, Julia Roberts, somebody, anyway, wearing a... Per, um, orange peignoir opened the door and um, I was half an hour early she says aren't you a bit young for this <laughs> uh, I said no no, no not, not, not at all she says do you want some tea so I said, that's very nice anyway we chatted around and she says well we better get to bed now 
the man from the solicitors will be here in five minutes. <laughs> and when I reported this back, I moved articles fairly shortly. <laughs> and I, I ended up in a, in a, in, in a small one-man practice in Palmer's Green, which was a North London suburb. I suppose I'd better say something about Gibson and Weldon. What I did was I managed... I never wanted to be a solicitor, so I didn't concentrate on, on becoming... Uh, on doing my exams properly. I used to go to my room, because in those days one lived at home, you know, uh, and I used to read French literature, of which I was, and I believe still am, an expert, uh, instead of doing my law um, papers. So as a result, I failed the final a number of times... I, I say it's four times. <laughs> it may have been five, but as I get older, I reduce it. I mean. So a couple of years' time, I shall have passed first time. But in fact, I used to go to the law... Well, I first went to the Law Society's School of Law, which was a dreadful place in the Bayswater Road, which was jam-packed with what was called working girls, because it was a thing called the Norwegian Seamen's um, Home Hostel, opposite the law... Um, school of Law and or the Law Society School of Law and you used to walk past these girls and in those days we all had bowler hats we used to take our bowler hats off and say good morning they'd say good morning miss and after a time they, they were just waiting for the um, seamen to come home or whatever and they didn't bother us at all and we just said good morning Susie or whatever they were called uh, in a dreadful place the, the lectures took um, I think they were about an hour and a half um, and they were humorless. You, you, they were, you were dictated to for an hour and a half. And as I wasn't desperately interested anyway, I wanted to become a professional wrestler at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, I, was, I, was, I, I, I got to the stage where, as an amateur, I could. Um, I, I, I rang up Dale Martin, who were the wrestling uh, promoters at the time. And they said, yes, son, come along any Saturday afternoon, bring your, bring your kit with you, any, have a tryout. And that week, I broke my knee. Nice. Uh, and <coughs> this is how I qualified, because I've got nothing else to do by then. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else was reduced. So I went to Gibson and Weldon. For, and uh, there I did actually, you know, I was taught law. And uh, I, I was telling Matthew that... Uh, the, the question I had to fill in before I was allowed to come here this evening uh, who was the most memorable person I met at College of Law or Gibson and this was a, a, absolute out and out crammers the most impressive man I met he got a girl he, I was on crutches with my knee and he used to carry my books for me and he got a girlfriend and she got Harlequin shoes and I was so impressed with these um, Harlequin shoes and he said one day, he said, um, whatever she was called, C Carol and I are going to Chelton Races, why don't you come with us? And fool-like, uh, I went to a lecture on matrimonial law instead. Um, now, he was the most impressive. He qualified, he never practised, and um, he was, I think, the most impressive man I met there. But after that, I had to leave my principal, my, my place in town, and I joined uh, this, uh, this man who was, um, he'd been a prisoner of war, and he'd been one of, one of what was now we call the magic circle firms, who said as a result of service to your country, because I think he had the DFC, uh, we'll give you articles. He'd started as the office boy, but you will not get a job with us. When you qualify, you leave us. And in those days, the day you qualified, you could set up on your own that was what he did. And he had got a very good little practice. And I joined him, and I was there within four or five years. I qualified eventually. Uh, the day I qualified, or the day after I qualified and got my certificate, um, there was a, a ceremony at the Law Society. I don't know, do you have, have things like that? Still but I was, began with M, and therefore I was in the second half. And by the time I got up there, the tea had run out and so had the sandwiches. <laughs> and A to L's had got it first. And I thought that was a meta for my, my career. <laughs> but the day after I qualified, I was sent off um, to do uh, um, a defence of a shoplifter at Marlborough Street. Stipendiaries in those days. You've got men 
but slide with this in Leeds, have you or not? Yeah. Uh, single lame, single stipendary magistrate qualified. There's one in Hull. Anyway, uh, they were terrifying, terrifying in those days. Um, when the girl says to me on the pavement outside, what am I going to get? And I'd looked up the law, and I suppose this is one lesson. Um, I said, well, six months is the maximum, and she passed out. <laughs> What I didn't realise and what I should have done is when I went to court, I should have spoken to somebody and said, what do they give shoplifters, first-time shoplifters? And um, the answer was that Marlborough Street in those days, £25. You could loot the whole of the perfume department at Selfridges and it was still £25. <laughs> and um, the, the man to whom I was articled didn't, or, or, or to whom I was now his assistant solicitor, didn't really appreciate that I'd spent the whole morning in town uh, when all she was going to be fined was £25. He rather blamed me. But there was a Welsh guy who was called Sidney Powell, who did a bit of crime on, in the attic on the top floor. And he was, he reckoned he'd been had a trial for Wales. He was called Sandy after the musical comedian. And he had a friend who was the chief of detectives for a small firm of um, supermarkets, long gone, swallowed up. Um, he decided that I should take over prosecuting. And this was a thing I did, and this is what I learned enormously from, that you can't really, you must never say, I, wa I, I will never prosecute, because it's such good training to see how prosecution works because then you can learn how to defend as a result. Anyway, there was this gorgeous-looking Swiss girl who was a store detective uh, who used to go round with me, and it was terrible in those days. These poor people, uh, there were no, it wasn't like today. They went out with two or three shillings and um, picked up something worth shops or so on, and they didn't have the money on them, and it was so easy to get a conviction. You couldn't you know, believe it. But <clears throat> one, uh, so this girl used to ring up and say, um, got two at Wilston tomorrow, or three at Hendon, or two at Tottenham, or whatever. And so I used to go along. I picked up the papers there and then, and there were no problems. And I, I was going to tell you this one story, if I may, of uh, I was at Wilston, and this lady had picked up a piece of meat. Um, what happened, I used to have to go along and say, please may I have compensation for the meat and ten and sixpence costs, or whatever it was in those days. And what she'd done is <coughs> she'd stolen the meat. In those days it wasn't wrapped, it was on a sort of cool counter, and she'd put it between her legs, and like a penguin, she'd waddled out. <laughs> <laughs> the store detective, they had to get out of the shop because that could prove that they they could always, if they were still in the shop, they'd say, oh, I was coming back. So, but once they were over the threshold, that was it. So anyway, um, she tapped her on the shoulder, and the woman had sort of dropped the meat on the pavement. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, um, isn't there a claim for compensation? And she said, no. I said, no. She said, no, we, we rinsed it down and put it back on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> And it was after that, about two, three weeks after that, I'd always intended to ask her out, but she was, you know, I've just never had the nerve. I was a terribly shy boy in those days. And <laughs> she, um, she rang up and said, can I come round and see you this evening? So I said, is it a very complicated case? She said, I'll tell you when I get here. And what had happened is she'd been done for shoplifting herself. <laughs> and I got her up to see this Welsh guy in the attic. I never saw her again, and I don't think... I ever prosecuted from that day to the, well, not, not from that day, but that until the end of my career. Um, the other thing I was going to say, and this was this is sort of a bit of a thing, one of the things I learned very early on is you must not be unkind to people um, who are not as intelligent or as bright as you are. Uh, Defendants, generally speaking, it may well be that fine, you can make fun of them if they're um, Bernie Saunders or somebody like that, but you mustn't 
mustn't do it to the general public. And I remember specifically I was at Tottenham and I prosecuted a woman who was accused of stealing a tin of salmon. And her defence was that it had leapt off the shelf <laughs> into her basket. And I very, very wittily um, said, oh, it was spawning time, was it? <laughs> and she got one conviction previously. She was convicted, of course. She went to prison for 14 days. And I always thought I, you know, I should never have said that to her. About six weeks, two months later, her husband rang up and said, could um, she come in and see me? And she'd done, done again. And he said, I, th I thought he was going to complain about how I'd treated his wife and he wanted me to defend her this time and he said um, ask, her, ask her what day of the week it is and uh, she didn't know, I said what month is it, she said I didn't know, I said what's the name of the queen, she didn't know that and she got galloping dementia and I just exposed this and humiliated this woman and I always had learned that lesson I remember her name to this day, and it's always been on my conscience that that was how badly I treated that woman. It was a lesson I learned. Anyway, that's me. Yeah, I, I, and I think um, having heard of, of what was perhaps a, a very different experience of uh, legal education to what we, we obviously proudly represent here now, um, but through to obviously your start as a prosecutor, yeah. how did you get into what was a real, I suppose, career centred around defence work? Well, basically, in those days, you could, you got criminal work. I, I started out, um, as I say, prosecuting, and what happened is a number of people uh, came to me and said, um, I don't want you to prosecute my family. Uh, these were the sort of general little villains of the area. Uh, here's a retainer. Uh, so you can defend them and not prosecute them. I'd given up prosecuting them by anyway, but it didn't matter. And so that came the other way. Was uh, it was Tottenham Magistrate I used to go to regularly, and the jailers there. There was no legal aid. Well, there was legal aid, no duty solicitors or anything like that. <coughs> and um, the jailers used to send the clients, or well, not up to me, but say, "There's a man here for rob well, robbery eventually, but." Uh, housebreaking um, or shop breaking uh, he wants to see you and so I would go down and represent him possibly get him legal aid I didn't know what happened I always assumed that the financial matters were dealt with between the jailer and the, cl and the client and that he gave the jailer a few quid for, or a few shillings for arranging representation then one day, this went on nicely, and I was getting lots and lots of work, and eventually I'll come back and tell you about a man called Bertie Smalls, who they sent up to me, and that was the man who really started my criminal practice. Um, but uh, I, I was in the, in the men's lavatories, uh, and the jailer sort of came and sidled up to me and said, could I have a word, sir? So I was, of course. Uh, he says, uh, we've been sending you work. Uh, I said, yes. Yes, I'm very grateful. He said, well, it's time to put it on a proper basis. Um, we've decided it's five pounds for every case we send you and another two shillings, uh, another two pounds, ten shillings if it goes to the, what was Sessions or the Old Bailey. And I saw, quite honestly, just a week before that, I represented somebody and for a day and a half case at the Old Bailey, and we'd been paid £22. And I said, well, it doesn't matter, you know, I don't suppose the Law Society really would approve of this anyway, but I couldn't afford it. And so he shuffled off, and he still sent me work, uh, and that was how I, I started getting stuff from the jailer. Nobody else really in the area wanted to do crime. And so there was a big, you know, there was a, a vacuum to fill one of the people he sent me was the man, well, there were two men who really built my practice. One was called Bertie Smalls, who was a bank robber, and the other was called Jackie O'Connell, who was a safe breaker, um, both long dead. It was said of Jackie O'Connell, 
that he was the best safe breaker in North London and the luckiest. If he went to do a safe, it would have been left unlocked with the week's takings in it. Um, he eventually became involved in a very big case. I wasn't representing him. And he arranged to have his, to be shot, um, so to get an adjournment, so he could be separated from the rest of the case. And unfortunately, the man got too close and blew his leg off. Bertie Smalls was the big, big um, bank robber of the time, 1960s, 1970s. He um, was a big, fat man, going bald, thin hair, which was streaked across. He was a big drinker as well. Uh, but he ran, if you read a book called, I think it's called Cops and Robbers, it was about him and the police. I didn't write it. Um, but it was about Bertie's career. Uh, he eventually w w was caught and grasped up all his, all his mates. But um, one of the reasons he was caught was that uh, he was something of a, of a gent in his way. He, um, Wood Green was a big thoroughfare, North London thoroughfare, and off it were a whole series of interlocking alleyways. So you could do a bank robbery and get into the alleyways and at the other end of them would be your car waiting to get away. But you could run through these alleyways and it was like a maze, really. And um, this, was, this was the prosecution's case because I saw the papers. Uh, bank raid goes off at, I don't know, Lloyd's Bank, Wood Green. And some woman was pushing her baby up the, uh, one of these alleyways when three men, masked men, thunder past, um, shot, shot guns at the ready. And she thinks this is the end of her. And uh, they just thunder past. And she's cowering up against the fence. And they're gone, and she thinks life's all right. And then, about 200 yards behind, comes the fat, sweating, unmasked Bertie, uh, who stops, looks at her, and says, effing awful mate, a way of delivering, in it, girl. <laughs> and just thundered on. <laughs> on another occasion, he knocked a woman down as he came out of the bank and picked her up. And she recognised him from the photographs. That was what did him. But uh, he then started sending me heavy plants. He'd got a girlfriend who was... Uh, an abortionist, and so I got a lot of those clients. This was before the Abortion Act um, was passed. A lot of clients uh, who were robbers, um, who were heavy, um, st what standover men, um, extortionists, standing over, demanding money with menaces from small clubs and billiard halls and things like that. And so I had this practice, really, in North London, of, of a complete heavy North London gang, gangs. And this is still the same practice that you did the articles with? No, no, no. Oh, no, by then, uh, this uh, the, the man to whom I was articles and to whom I was solicitor, he had a, a great idea <coughs> that uh, he did anything he could for elderly ladies. Uh, because in those days... Uh, it wasn't improper for a solicitor to be left some money by these old ladies in their wills. It is now. <clears throat> and he hoped, and this is part of my articles, and the managing clerk, not the Welsh one upstairs, but another one, he and I spent a lot of time cutting old ladies' grass, uh, getting their cats out <laughs> in the trees, doing their shopping, things like that. And um, he hoped, and, and this man actually... I'll call him Simpson anyway. Simpson uh, did benefit quite a lot from, um, from uh, the wills. And it was a productive and it was tax-free, of course. He came <laughs> on stuck, I remember. Uh, we were going to town, he and I, um, see council or something or other. And <clears throat> some lady was at the bus stop and he takes off his Homburg hat and says, good afternoon. And he's, he's done you know, everything. I've cut her lawn and the He's done a tax accountancy and advised her where she should go on holiday and things like that, um, all for free. 
And he says, good afternoon, Mrs. Miss Smith, or whatever. I haven't seen no. She says, oh, no, she says, I've sold my house and gone to live with my sister. He said, oh, you didn't come to me to do the conveyance. And she said, no, I couldn't go on asking you to do things for nothing. <laughs> I, I had been thinking it would be time to get a rise, but uh, I didn't ask for one that afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, he had a good divorce practice. That was most, uh, most odd because... One of the um, ways you did a divorce petition in those days, you, you um, wrote down all the nasty words. That mainly it was women who were deciding that the man they'd married they didn't have to put up with for the rest of their lives. And so they, they, there were divorce petitions, and very often, you, it would make weight almost, you put down the names he called her at the breakfast table. So slut, whore prostitute, and you'd say anything else. And this, the, the women wouldn't say what this other word was. And eventually, um, it was meadow lady. So you got up in the courts, or the barrister did, and he would say, and now, Mrs. Smith, he called you a number of names, and that included meadow lady, did it? And she'd say, oh, yes, he called me meadow lady decree nicer. And this went on and on and on. And I could never get them to tell me what a meadow lady was. And eventually I, I talked to one of the sprightlier ones and I said, what's a meadow lady? She said, I can't tell you. So I said, well, would you write it down? And it was C-O-W. And so all this time the husband's been calling you stupid cow. And, <laughs> and she it was they were saying, he called me a stupid meadow lady. And no judges had said anything, you know, anything about it. It just sort of passed as a, a word. Now, the funny thing was that this word, a, a meadow lady, was only used in that suburb because I went and talked to other people over the years. And I said, well, do, you, do they call it meadow lady, you know, across the old circular? No, it was absolutely a word used only in that suburb. <laughs> so, as your um, practice then took off, um, yeah. and you became what was really, uh, you know, a, you were a known um, defence lawyer yeah. in, in London, um, with <coughs> heavy weight clients, is yes. that fair to say. W what was life like? I mean, uh, what was a typical working day like? I mean, what, what adjustments? I think one of the things that we, we, we um, were talking about prior to... to um, this evening, was how you really learned the language of the client. It was oh yes, you, you, well you, you learned the language of the client, rather like Meadow Lady, only in spades redoubled. I mean, my client spoke in this total Cockney rhyming slang, and uh, there was one of them who used to say uh, he, he spoke absolutely in in Cockney rhyming slang, and he'd say, um, "Sorry, I'm late, Mr. M." Uh, I've had trouble with your apples. I've had a bull with the strife. And you had to interpret it. Nice whistle you've got. And working backwards, nice whistle and flute suit. Had trouble with the... Um, I've had a bull, bull and cow. The stairs, apples and pears. Mm. It worked out. Anyway, one day, he got, he got done for some, uh, a thing which... His, Verbals were, verbals were the alleged uh, confession he made to the police. And uh, it went something like, I was having a pony in the carsey when this pikey smell flashes me his groin and we're swagged down the peter by the filth for some smut of Tom. <laughs> and he says, Mr. M., it's all porkies. You know I don't spiel like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, afterwards, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what it all means if you really want to, but I don't think, don't think it'll take your, your very much further. But uh, in fact, curiously enough, that was London slang. You could have exactly Birmingham slang. It was obviously different, but again, only Birmingham. I had some friends in Scotland, and they sent me down a whole sort of dictionary of criminal rhyming slang in Scots, uh, in Glaswegian slang. 
I presume the same with Liverpool, say. And in terms of, I suppose, a, a typical day or a week, you were getting calls day and night oh, well, to you your hope, home. You hoped you were, because otherwise you weren't getting any any work. You know, you've got to pay the rent, yes. But these uh, were the relatives or indeed relatives, the actual accused that were well, calling? Sometimes they were the accused, very often the relatives. Um, there was always a dawn raid, by, I say a dawn raid, about seven in the morning the police would raid my clients and you would hear them going downstairs calling, get Morton, get Morton! <laughs> and you would then uh, ring up the police station after a suitable time or, or the wife would ring up and they would deny all knowledge of where your client had been or they would say he didn't want to see you. And you could play this game for sort of up to a week and they would move these, these were heavy clients. I mean, we're not talking of shoplifters or something like that. These were, these were serious bank robbers, armed robbers. Um, but they would move them around police stations so you could never find them. And so they could genuinely say, oh, he's not with us. We, we sent him on. I don't know where it was. And I remember the most um, extreme example of this was a, a man who was involved in a very nasty tie-up and robbery um, in Dunstable, which is um, just outside London. And he was arrested in London, and it took me a week to find him, and he was in Stoke. They moved him all over the countryside to keep him out of solicitors' hands while they continued to investigate him. And the only thing you could do was eventually you could go, after this had gone on five, six days, you could go to the uh, court and say, and only this of course if the client's any money uh, go to a court asking for a writ of habeas corpus uh, and the judge would never give it to you, but what he would say is you, you must produce him or let your let the solicitor see him within 24 hours and that was uh, what, what um, happened, they would always by then produce him, but by then of course you hadn't seen him and he'd made all these verbal admissions. I only did it for the kiddies, so. things like that. Got me banned to rights, you have. <laughs> and it was very difficult. In those days, the judges knew exactly that this was complete lies but on behalf of the police, um, but they didn't do anything about it. It was part of the game. But I don't like you had, sh you had a thing called sus, which was a terrible... Um, charge, it was worth three months uh, being a suspected person with loitering with intent to commit a felony. And one of the things was car door handles. They were seen trying car door handles. They were seen easing up uh, against a lady in the tube trying to pick the pocket. And uh, the police knew this was fake. I mean, this was the way that assistants, uh, what were called aides to CID, learnt their trade. They were told, go to Euston Station and I will be the other side and by the time you've been through Euston Station you've got to have an arrest and sus was the way to do it uh, the stipendiaries in London would generally speaking, provided you didn't challenge the police flat out, this is a lie um, but oh I was drunk and that was why I was leaning against car door handles to try and support myself because I'd been drinking uh, the magistrates would say there's a doubt in this. Lay magistrates wouldn't. But if you went flat out and said, obviously you're lying, um, no, no good at all. So it was a sort of game which everybody played. You used to have to play these games with the stipendary magistrates who were bored out of their minds uh, hearing all this sort of case day in, day out. Um, you, you used to say, they, they would ask you whether your client had got previous convictions which they weren't entitled to and, but it was phrased as can I, which meant has he got any previous convictions so I can send him up the road for sentence up to London Sessions for sentence and the reply was yes but I hope you won't generally speaking if you got to that stage with him, you know you, you knew what was going on can I I remember I'm defending one sti once in front of a stipendry, and it was an interesting case. The man who got a lot of form um, 
was found with a knife in his pocket as he came out of a billiard hall. He'd hung his coat up, played a game of billiards, and he said somebody had put a knife in his pocket. Uh, it may well have been right, but I remember defending, I said, <coughs> went through this, the police had said, uh, been advised, been warned this man was coming out. And he, um, he said, no, someone's planted it on me straight away. So I said, fine. And the stipendary said, haven't you any more questions, Mr. Morton? And that meant, aren't you going to put his character in? And I said, no, I, I have no more questions. He said, are you sure? And I said, well, yes, I'm afraid I am sure. Uh, which in the, anyway, <clears throat> I, I, I made my closing speech and said it's exactly the same. Clark, uh, here we are in Clark and well, there's no lock on the solicitor's room. If I leave my coat there and someone puts a knife in my pocket, uh, what's the difference between this and that? The difference at the stipendary is that I hope you would put your character in evidence. <laughs> he did acquit. <laughs> <laughs> so, having never really thought um, to pursue a career in law, you find yourself defending perhaps some of the most morally reprehensible characters in society. How did you feel about that? How, how did you justify... I, I, I don't going... think you have to justify. Uh, somebody must defend these people. You know, on occasions, they were actually innocent. Not very often, but they were. <laughs> um, and if they said, I didn't do it, then they were entitled to be defended. And you're entitled. I, or you, you, you could say to them, well, look... Um, <coughs> You've been seen um, coming out of the bank. They've got photographs. The money's been found uh, in, in the fireplace behind a load of bricks. Uh, you've made a confession three pages long. And they would say, well, the confession was beaten out of me. It wasn't a picture of me. It was my twin brother. Um, somebody must have planted the money behind the fireplace. And if this, you could say, well, you know, Really, it's an awful lot to get over. Um, but A, uh, if they said, no, that's it, I'm sticking to that story, well, then you, you went on with it. Um, if you said, the difficulty was that if you told them too much, they would go to another solicitor, and this time they'd learn what to say. Um, but no, you know, if, if, if they said they were not guilty, they were not guilty. And I, I was saying that, that I think that if you defend or practice criminal law, you can't pick and choose. The only time you should not take a case is if it is you don't understand it. And I remember fairly early in my career, I represented a fraudsman, and he was far smarter than I was. He had me running rings. Um, he went down and got four years eventually. But I, I learned, just don't, I did, never really understood this. I, never understood mathematics and how fraud worked and he s just ran rings around me and I should never have taken the case because I didn't know what was going on but I don't think for example uh, in the 80s there was a very very fashion that you didn't defend rapists or some solicitors wouldn't or you didn't defend rapists when consent was an issue I think that's wrong. I mean, I don't. I mean, I never liked defending rape cases, but I don't think you can pick and choose. You can't say, "Oh well, this case is so disgusting. I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to defend somebody who's beat an old lady in the alleyway and stolen her purse. I'm not going to defend a boy who's defecated on somebody's bed in a housebreaking." You either defend or you don't. It's not for you as a defence lawyer. A, a number of people don't agree with me, but it's not for you, I believe, as a defence lawyer to pick and choose. You defend or you don't. And as I say, the only time you don't is if you don't understand what's going on. I mean, I could never start defending these big fraud cases now. No idea. I did prosecute one once. It was a dog track, a greyhound racing track, tote fraud. It was only when I sat down, having cross-examined, I realised how he'd done it. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, 
In terms of, I suppose, your personal dealings with the, the people you defended, I mean, did you ever feel threatened or intimidated by them? No. Um, there were two, two people whom I didn't defend who were about half as big again as I am, uh, who um, used to go around as a pair, and they would sit, if you sat down, they would sit on either side of you. And I was always apprehensive of meeting them. Uh, but no, I was never threatened. I was never threatened. And I think that the other thing was that I didn't mix with the clients. Now, a number of people did. Uh, a number of people thought it was a very way of relating and getting to know the client. As far as I was concerned, they were always Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith. They could call me James if they wanted to, but I, I didn't. I think, I mean, I wouldn't have, I, I would have coffee with outside, you know, the, the coffee machine at court, but I would never go out to have coffee in the cafe opposite. I would never be seen with them. I would never give them a lift to court. I would never accept a lift from them, except one night when I made a great mistake and I defended Bertie Smalls on an ID, or I represented him, not defended, on an ID parade up in Stoke. This was just the start of the um, motorway, and I said to the officer in the case, why, um, why have you picked on Smalls? Aren't there any local villains? He said, none who are capable of the job. Uh, I've been to see the only one possible, and he was flattered that we called to see him. <laughs> anyway, as I say, Bertie, so the small, fat man with thinning hair, and <clears throat> he was allowed to bring friends up who could stand on the parade with him. Some officers would let this uh, occur. You could bring your brothers, so you could have a whole line of little smalls, as it were. Um, <laughs> and others would know, no, you had to do it. You're, you know, we will choose who goes on the parade. And uh, doing this at night in Stoke, at 7 o'clock in a winter's evening, um, eventually we put a parade together, and Bertie, at the last minute, stands next to a man and says, change ties with me. And he does. And the man picks out, the witness picks out the man with the tie, which Bertie had had on. And I swear that going down the stairs, the man turns to the officer and said, you told me it was the one in the red tie. I don't know. Anyway, Bertie, uh, I've either got to stay in Stoke and this is many years ago when Stoke wasn't as salubrious as it is nowadays, uh, or I accept a lift back to London with, with these boy, with these villains. It's foggy. They've got a boy boxing at the Albert Hall, um, and they want to see him. And so we set off at hair, you know, hairing down. <clears throat> and they're saying, stop, whoever the driver was, Come on, Tommy, don't go so fast. For him's sake, no, Tommy, don't. It's foggy. He says, it's not as foggy as it was the night I don't bid Jerusio before the derby. And eventually we get to London, and I, I, I said at the, the tube station, the first tube station, don't worry, let me out here, I'll find my own way home. And uh, they did. And I, I never, ever went in a car with client again. <laughs> So I think that brings us on to what was really a, a second career for you in, in writing. And I suppose my first question is, what brought you to, to that? Well, I'd, al I'd always wanted to write, uh, apart from being a professional wrestler. I'd always wanted to write. And I, I'd started off in a very small way, doing little bits and pieces uh, for magazines, New Society... Uh, they were mostly on the law, these little snippets, and I got two or three quid for them or whatever. And it, things branched out, and I expanded. And I think if you're going to write, and this is another little lesson I learned, if you, you're going to write, you mustn't start writing on something about which you don't know. So, for example, there's no possible point <coughs> in your writing on butterflies, uh, unless you're absolutely dead keen on butterflies. Um, I did this once for once. I was the si for one whole week. I was the science chorus, the legal correspondent of New Scientist. Yes, <coughs> but um, 
he, he was no, anyway I did, I did that I had a play on the radio and it performed at an arts festival and things like that uh, I became um, the gambling correspondent about which I did know something uh, for uh, a, a girly magazine not you know a sort of junior playboy or something like that. And I was also the wine correspondent because whoever did the wine uh, column didn't actually put his um, copy in. And uh, so I did that for him. And then at one time, uh, sometimes the person who did the horoscopes didn't put his copy in. And so I was Joan the Wad, the Cornish Pixie. <laughs> Not every week. <laughs> Uh, and I, I, I always wanted to get out of the law. The whole, the whole thing of my, although I got a successful practice, I wanted out of the law. And eventually I found a man who would buy my practice on the instalment plan. We're talking about 69, something like that. And you can see that he wasn't successful, my plan. Um, but anyway, he put some money down, took over the files, took over... Um, my managing clerk, and I set off in a four, five, Fiat 500 with a girlfriend to drive to India. And we only got as far as Istanbul because we couldn't get any insurance. And we were panic stricken because I don't know, in those days certainly, uh, there were no such things as traffic lights in Istanbul. Uh, or there were none, they didn't observe them anyway, and we, we, I lost my nerve. Drove back, came back after about six months. Um, to London and the man said I don't want your practice let me off the rest of the money and you can have it back managing clerk back I realised I wasn't ever going to make you know, write the great English travel novel and so I took the practice back and it took me until 1985 to get rid of the practice when eventually I managed the bank manager then really got rid of the practice because he said, we, you know, your overdraft is just running up. Legal aid wasn't paying, could take you a year to be paid by the old Bailey. And legal aid was on the decline. And eventually I found two men who I thought were respectable to buy the practice. They were qualified solicitors. One of them, um, I had a really handsome oak desk, which I, I wanted to keep uh, and wasn't included in the price. Uh, they paid a few installments and uh, then one of them died of a heart attack at my desk because he hadn't paid for that. He'd been to Las Vegas. He was enormously overweight. He'd been to Las Vegas, came back overnight, came into the office and on my desk. The last I heard of the other one was that he'd escaped from a French prison. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I made up all the back fees had come in for me. I cleared off the draft, and so I went to university. I went to Hull to become a uh, to do criminology. The reason was I went to Hull was that the only they were the only place who would take me to do a masters without a BA, because of course I hadn't been to university, so I hadn't got a BA. So I was allowed. They took the view very generously that being a solicitor was the equivalent of a BA. I'm not sure they were right. But anyway, I went up there and, um, and that was... Uh, I, I thought that crime and criminology were the same thing, but as you, you probably understand, crime is, did they do it? Uh, did Tommy nail the cat's tail to the table? And criminology is, why did Tommy <laughs> nail the cats? I find it very difficult. They eventually... I must have been some good at it because they had me back, or it was a very poor university, one of them, because they had me back teaching. So, so it can't be been all that bad. So what inspired your, your first book then? The, the, the well, book? I was on the Boxing Board of Control. Oh, my first book. Oh, that's even worse because I actually wrote some books on criminal law. I don't know how I dared. <laughs> I, I, I still get royalties from one of them, which is even worse. So God knows where, who on earth is looking up how you defended in 19, sort of, what it was, 84. Um, but anyway, actually, I did write some textbooks. Then I wrote some books on criminal slang. 
And then I was on the Boxing Board of Control with a man called Nipper Reed, who caught the craze. He was the man who brought the craze down. And he'd had his biography written, and he didn't like it at all. And he said, I eventually persuaded him to let me try and do it. And I got an agent, but she got me a deal where I did that, and also a history of the London underworld from 1880 to what would be 1990. And I have to say they were both, ex well, Im immodestly, I say they were both really successfully sold, and they sold. And indeed, it's right to say that they're still selling today. Not very many, five or six, but you know, better, you know, they're still selling. Uh, and then after that, um, I had a bit of trouble with Gangland because I'd said something about a North London family to which they'd objected. And I, um, I sorted that out. And what I had done is I defended one of the big criminals was a man, man called Mad, Mad Frank Fraser in the Parkhurst riot. And I just sorted out this trouble with the North London team when I got a telephone call, would I ring Mr. Francis Fraser? Um, and there was nothing to do. I just had to ring him. I said, is that the Mr. Fraser? He said, yes. He says, I've got a copy of your book. I didn't buy it. I had it nicked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing my biography, and you're going to do it for you, for me, which was exactly, you know, like the Godfather. Uh, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. My agent said, what are you doing? Uh, the girl, you know, I was with at the time, said, what are you doing? Um, I didn't dare tell my mother. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I met Frank the next day. I, I got the, I, I picked the place to meet him, because I'd been seeing all these films. And I sat with my back to the wall, and um, Frank came in about a quarter of an hour later with his arm in a sling, and... Uh, he said, I'm sorry, I've been in hospital, I've broken my arm. I said, you could have cancelled. You know, he said, no, I said I was coming, and I was coming. And this was the thing about Fraser. If he said he would do something, he would do it. Uh, if he said he was going to break the governor's nose, he would break the governor's nose. If he said he was going to meet you at five o'clock, he would meet you at five o'clock. If you were there at five past, he would say, oh, James, perhaps I, I was beginning to think it was tomorrow we, we was He'd always be there, very polite, neat little man, cold, stone-cold eyes. I have every confidence he'd have killed me if it had suited him. Um, but we did five books together, and one of them's just been reprinted and is in the shops now, as they say. Asda. <laughs> <laughs> so are you working on a, a book now? We... Yeah, I expect got, to. You can expect in the shops, the proper shops, <laughs> W.H. Smith, um, <laughs> with luck, uh, a book on the craze coming out in, God, it's next month. Okay. Next month, November. And what's it called? What should we look up? It's called, it's called The Craze, The Final Word. Won't be the final word, of course, someone else will do another one. <laughs> that's, what it's, that's what it's called at the moment, The Craze, The Final Word. It's white with a picture of the twins on it. Surprise, surprise. And what do you think you've learned most from your um, time as an author and speaking to these people, perhaps having had, obviously, the benefit of working at the coalface of criminal defence? And What have I learned? Well, I think what I've learned is that um, you can make money out of crime, without <laughs> doubt. Um, what I've really enjoyed doing most is um, the research, which I really... F uh, I, I learned this at Hull University. If they taught me nothing else, it was how to do research. And I think that was what I, I learned there, uh, which is what I enjoy doing most. Uh, if you think that the moment you deliver your book to the publishers, that's all you need do until you read the glowing reviews, you are totally mistaken. You start... Um, a, a, a treadmill of corrections, editing of people who don't know what things are, do your, you know, um, proof reading, all be done within about three minutes, or the day before um, they delivered the papers to you. Um, 
it's hard work writing, but uh, the research is the fun. And I think the book I enjoy, well, I, I've enjoyed doing several books, but one of them is a thing called Lola Montez, who was a 19th century courtesan who ruined the King of Bavaria. Uh, five of her husbands and being lovers died in what could be called <coughs> unfortunate circumstances. <laughs> uh, so some of them were unforeseen as well. Uh, and she was a wonderful woman. She was born in 1821 and she dies in 1859. So that's what makes her 38, 39. Um, and she's been all over Europe, all over the world, uh, in unsprung coaches, uh, and had these rackety of adventures. She's bigamously married at least three times, possibly four. She horsewhipped a man uh, in Australia because he didn't like what she was doing. She appeared on the stage all over the world. She was a wonderful woman. Then she took to religion and died of syphilis. <laughs> That's not a sequitur. <laughs> um, but I enjoyed her most. And of course, the great thing was that she had to, I had to go to Australia to research her, Paris, a lot of time in Paris researching her, New York, Boston, oh, all sorts of places, California. If you're going to write books, you don't want to have characters who just live in Bogner Regis. You, you want them to, to live in useful, warm places. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it then, in your opinion, that makes a great book? What, what's the, the component? Readability. And factual. Did you see this, this woman who wrote a book about uh, hangings of homosexuals in the 19th century? In, uh, she's a woman called Wolf, I think, and an American academic. And she has written this book saying that uh, hanging of homosexuals did not stop until the 1860s when the act was passed. In fact, she's got it totally, totally wrong. It stopped in 1835 and she's based this treatise on research, which is f faulty. She didn't understand what the Old Bailey papers and the uh, assize papers meant when it said death sentence passed. It didn't mean that they were going to be hanged, but she took it that it did, and her book has now been pulped in America. So you've got to be quite careful. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I think brings. Because you've been paid thirty-five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, I suppose what what comes to to, to really um, final question: What advice can you impart to the audience um, who may wish to explore writing? How, how oh, if they... you want to, if you want to do it, and there's no question that if you really feel you must write, write, and merely because someone turns you down for your article on butterflies, don't <laughs> worry about it. Write on, and if you really want to do it, you will succeed. Not uh, if if somebody said, "Would you go into the law again?" under no circumstances whatsoever. <laughs> Would you try and be a writer again every minute of the day? Thank you very much. Um, I am sure you'll agree that was the most scintillating hour. Uh, I certainly spent a long time. Um, thank you very much, James, um, for obviously having made the trip up here. Um, I think that deserves a definite round of applause. <laughs>